I've always been looking for home, in some deep sense I couldn't name. Jim Sati brought many people home and helped me find parts of myself I didn't even know were lost. What home means to me a place of belonging? Lots of love. My mom. Home for me is here and now. Home to me is like meeting friends on the street. Hugging them, that's home to us on the street. Serenity, sometimes. Kind of like a simple life, but rich with his surroundings, like his beliefs and his faith. His yeah. faith in in God, in God, yeah. and mm -hmm. nature, and he was part of nature. Like he lived it, he lived with it. <laughs> you felt drawn to him. And he had this pleasant face that just exuded uh, a, a relationship to you, like you were very important. You were very important to me. That's how he made me feel. You were just who you were, and accepted, and, and valued, really. He just had that presence about him. And um, he wouldn't just share that with family. He would give it to everybody. He would share it with everybody. Jim Seti, loving grandfather, community builder, spiritual mentor. A simple life deeply rooted in spirit and in the land. He had an amazing effect on those he touched. His gentle presence led those he met home. This is his story. Jim and my dad were wardens together in the late 50s in Prince Albert National Park. Saskatchewan, in Western Canada. I love to tell Dad's stories of those times. There are the stories of long days fighting forest fires and weeks out on patrol and the lynx that tried to jump in the canoe. The time Dad carried a log chewed on by a beaver 20 miles out of the bush because he wanted to make a lamp out of it. And then there are his stories about Jim Satie. Dad would get real quiet when he talked about Jim. Dad said Jim loved the land and the lakes and told him stories of the people that had lived there. But for me, the most memorable story Dad told about Jim Satie is the story of a lost boy. Jim knew all these lakes like the back of his hand, and he was really good in the bush. Now once, when Jim was away, a young boy got lost off Kingsmere Lake. I was on the search team that looked for that boy for three days, couldn't find him. Finally, we called Jim. He asked where the boy had last been seen, and he just stood there on that same spot for a few minutes. Then Jim took off into the bush on his own. Two hours later, six miles deep into the bush, Jim walked straight to where that boy was. On the night he began, Muskeg over there, not rough muskeg, just that leg grass, you know. I see those uh, rocks again, but I pick up, I know that that's a human. So I followed that. I stood there in the hall. The hall was just a, a prisoner, I was put standing prisoner on top. I watched him on two occasions. 
find small children that were lost in the forest. Jim would uh, be gone on his own. He didn't want a group of people with him. He wanted to know where the child was last seen. And then he would do his thing. And invariably, he found these children and brought them home. And I wanted to know, Jim, how do you do that? How can you go into the forest and tell a child's track uh, in the grass and, and uh, separate that? from the wild animals that roam throughout this forest. I don't remember meeting Jim Satie in my childhood, but the story of the lost boy stayed vivid in my mind. I was 25 when I had my first opportunity to meet Jim, and I felt like I was meeting a legend. He was speaking at the Park Community Hall about First Nation and Métis history. My heritage is what's known as country-born, a mix of Scottish and First Nation, in my case, Swampy Cree. We're part of the mixed blood Métis Nation. But when I met Jim, and when I was growing up, we were known to most people as Scottish or English. After I heard his talk, I realized I wanted to find out more about who I was and where I belonged. At that time in my life, I was lost. I could relate to that boy who was lost out in the bush. I said, Mr. Satie, you won't remember me, but I'm one of Andy and Dorothy's daughters. And he took my hand, and I still remember how soft his hands were and how warm. And he said, he looked at me with this great gentleness and this twinkle in his eye, and he said, 20 years after working with my folks, are you, are you Jeannie? And I said, yes. He said, I remember you. I remember you sleeping in a basket on the porch of your parents' cabin. And we were all working around. And we just kept working and working. And you slept and slept and slept. And in that moment, I just really felt how, why Dad was moved by him. He had, I just felt really special in that moment that he, and he gave me a gift in that moment. He gave me the gift of a memory of my family, and he gave me the gift in that giving. He gave me this gift of saying, I, I, I know you. I remember you. Here's a piece about you. And, and I think that he did that to a lot of people. I think that was the one of the ways he gifted people. It was just this feeling that when you were, were in his company that uh, you were special. Yeah. And after that, I started to visit Jim. And he became for me, although I didn't visit him a lot, every time I visited him, he gave me something very important that in a way brought me home to myself. I was thrilled to be making this film, and we had just started when Jim Satie passed away. I didn't know if I could finish without him. I felt lost. But Jim's gifts kept encouraging me. This film is what his life is showing me about coming home. Jim Satie gave the gift of being remembered, the gift of connection and caring. To the Cree, this sense of kinship is the heart of what is called Wakotowin, one community. Wakotowin is a sample of all of us in this room are relatives in the Indian way. We are all re related because we share the same uh, lives, l livelihood. Um, the air we breathe, the land we walk on, the relationship that we develop, how we treat each other. And Jim embodied that. Whether you were a non-native or native or a relative or not a relative in the blood sense, he honored that, that in you, and that's uh, my attraction to him was, was uh, very much that experience that, that being felt honored by Jim. For Jim, there were many ways home. He found it in his close connection to nature. He knew and embraced his heritage 
giving him a sense of direction through good times and bad. Jim received the values of love and respect from a remarkable lineage of spiritual leaders, including his great-grandfather, the Reverend James Settee Sr., an embodiment of Wakuhtuin. The Reverend James Settee Sr. grew up immersed in the teachings of his family and his people, the Cree, and in 1881 wrote an account of his childhood. My grandfather had been elected chief of all tribes living along the coast of the Hudson Bay. At the feast, he was called to invoke the gods of the air to come and take part of the food. The Reverend James Settee Sr. was an author and artist whose writing and sketches now give unique insight into the history of the Cree. He was an advocate for land issues and economic independence for his people. He had an enduring partnership with his wife, Sally, a member of a prominent mixed blood family. He forged new ground in his dedication to the values he found common in both his Cree tradition and the new Anglican teachings. As a young lay priest in 1846, he founded what is now the famous Stanley Mission in northern Saskatchewan, currently the oldest active parish in Western Canada and a national historic site. The Reverend James Settee was able to nurture the values common amongst all people. After breakfast, the Indians and Icelanders assembled in one Indian house. I preached from John 4.16. The words were, God is love. First to the Icelanders, and then to my people. First in Cree, and then in Soto. The Reverend James Seti Sr., September 24th, 1877. His descendants, following his example, became dedicated spiritual leaders his son, the Reverend John Richard Settee, risked his life serving victims of smallpox. His grandson, John Robert Settee, was a respected school teacher and lay priest. His great-grandson, our Jim Settee, was born in 1911 to Métis and First Nation parents John Robert and Catherine at Montreal Lake in central Saskatchewan. From an early age, he was immersed in the values of the Anglican faith, and through the Cree tradition, he developed a deep connection with the land. As he grew older, this rich heritage would guide and sustain Jim in the face of very great difficulties. The first of his life challenges came when Jim wanted to go to high school. He had to leave the tutelage of his father to attend the Onion Lake Residential School. Conditions in the residential school system destroyed traditional Aboriginal culture and left children vulnerable to abuse. In 2008, the Canadian government formally apologized and began the process of compensating students. While at school, Jim managed to find ways to quietly mentor his fellow students and later, as an elder, help many heal from their experience. I spent a lot of time in residential school, but like I said before, that my dad died when I was about two and a half, three years old, and I did not have a father figure to, to look up to, and it was very difficult. And I listened to a lot of uh, elders, uh, like Jim, for instance, when he said that uh, uh, love and respect, and, 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 and uh, rather than uh, shouting at people or hollering at your children or one thing or another, talk nice to them, you know, that's what he used to say. When Jim graduated from school, he found seasonal work. In the winter, he hauled freight with horse and sleigh. In the spring, he built highways, and in the summer, he fought forest fires. In all of these jobs, he met elders who taught him about history, traditions, and the land. He later passed this wisdom on to others. I think People just felt good around him, listening to his stories. I can see him yet around the fire, the campfire, and he'd have us all laughing. He was telling me about uh, how to cook and eat, eat a pelican. And he says, you get your pelican, and you pluck the feathers off him, and cut him up, and throw him in a big pot, 
throw in a couple of pieces of two by four and boil them for three days. And after three days, you throw away the pelican and eat the two by four. <laughs> so that was, don't forget that. <laughs> Jim's community included First Nation and Métis communities settled around several lakes in central Saskatchewan. By the early 1920s, tourists and business people began building cabins throughout the region, and in 1927, Prince Albert National Park was formed. The establishment of the park created another challenge for Jim and his people. When the park opened, Everyone was told they had to move, but the business people and tourists were given extensions or were granted cabin lots. Most long-term residents whose ancestors had lived in the area for thousands of years had to move immediately. Jim's people had to leave everything behind. Hunters returned to empty cabins, their families gone overnight. The Métis were not allowed to move with their First Nation relatives onto the surrounding reserves. They joined thousands of homeless Métis across the province. Growing up with this history, Jim responded by helping his people stay connected to their communities. He remembered the families and their homes around the many lakes in the region. And for the next 80 years, he kept their stories alive. If you told him your name, he knew who you were related to. He could tell you your family tree almost. That, that's how well he knew a lot of these people. In 1935, Jim married Jemima Ballantyne of the Montreal Lake Cree Nation, and they started their family of seven. Although they weren't allowed to live on the reserve, they gave their children pride in both their Cree and Métis roots. In 1945, Jim took action which would create a home for them and some of the other displaced Métis families. He approached the provincial government and helped negotiate the Fish Lake Métis settlement located close to Jemima's home reserve just south of Prince Albert National Park. Although similar projects were run by the government, the Fish Lake Settlement operated independently. Jim and other members provided leadership in educational and political issues. Over the next 50 years, Fish Lake would be home base to Jim and Jemima and many other families. The Métis community of Fish Lake flourished close to their Cree relatives and to their seasonal work. One time I remember he was talking to my dad. I just went to Regina to talk, talk to the leaders. Then he made it through that, and he found this uh, midi settlement, they call it Fish Lake. That's where they built a school close by. This is where we used to run and dive into our pool there. <laughs> a bunch of bloodsuckers. <laughs> We'd haul it to this, to the next family. The that family would haul it to the next uh, family, so that the the message finally arrived that to where it was supposed to. It. Yeah, that was our our uh, Indian communication. <laughs> this we used to live here for years. No power yet to cut his own wood. Then he'd go early in the morning to his trap light, check his traps. 50, 20 kilometers one way. And as there was no trail, just bush trail, a snowshoe trail more or less, my, grand, my grandpa and Jim should they meet, meet, and then, then they come back the same day. 
Jim and Jemima raised their children and later helped raise their grandchildren at Fish Lake. I remember coming to Fish Lake and uh, you'd feel honored to, to be there. They, they treated you in a very honorable way as a family, you know? And uh, so you were a visitor and they treated you like a, like a very honored guest, you know? Through this time, Jim served as community interpreter, translator, storyteller, advocate, and one-man employment bureau. They'd bring that letter to Dad, and Dad would uh, write a letter for them. And all they had to do was post it. <laughs> Just like uh, if they want forms filled out, well, then they used to bring that and them to Dad and fill it out. In the spring, we got those, those uh, tea force lifts, they used to call it. That has to be filled out to get a refund. And Jim said he was the only one that could, could fill him out for us. Eh? He was always looking for a uh, work, not only for himself, but everybody. I don't know how he found his job in uh, Washington picking apples. Eh? A whole bunch of them from Tweetsboro. He got a job for them up there in the fall. Eh? Jim and his people were instrumental in building Prince Albert National Park, building patrol cabins, fighting forest fires, teaching new wardens, and landscaping the beach and the town site. So that was uh, Jim said he was, was his idea that we had to come, all, all of us come out here to work, to build this waski so the beautiful, they call it now, something to think about, eh? After all those years, what he, what he have done for other people and for us people too, his relative. In his older years, Jim came home to a lifelong calling. At the age of 80, he decided to go to theological college, following in the footsteps of three generations of settees. He graduated from the college named after his own great-grandfather. At the age of 86, Jim Settee became the oldest man to be ordained in the history of the Anglican Church. We think of him now as a model priest, but in many ways he was a model layperson. He was uh, very involved in the church, very supportive, and very constructive all the way along the line. Uh, one day he brought in for me a, um, a hymn that he had translated, which was Amazing Grace. And um, I was very pleased to see this because this was uh, the period where they were talking about uh, publishing a new hymn book for the Anglican Church. So I sent that in and it was published. In active ministry for eight years, Jim traveled wherever he was needed, comforting and counseling, with a special heart for reaching young people. Under his encouragement, the church where his father preached was renewed. Jim baptized all of his great-grandchildren and gave services in Cree and English. And like his great-grandfather, he nurtured the values common amongst all people. He used to always say, you're all praying to the same God. There's just many different forms. And I encourage you to pray the way that you pray. I practice our traditional ways, but still believe in Jesus, you know. Yeah. Still pray to him, too, every day. This is my grandson, Eldon, you know. He, uh, he smudges with me every morning. Uh, we pray together. You know, uh, and actually, he, uh, when we go to bed at night, we also pray together, you know. That's your Bible. I'm trying to share his knowledge, trying to sh share with people what he had taught me. In 2005, at the age of 94, 
Jim became seriously ill. Now I'm going to say my prayers to horn you or my dad. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He would uh, always come up and remind us to, you know, pray before we make sure you pray before you go to bed. And every night, yeah, so, and that is something now I do with my children that I had gotten from him and, and Grandma. Um, as young kids, Grandma used to pray to us. Forever and ever, amen. Here goes the Papa. My grandpa was almost like the, the, the piece that held our family together. He still does, because he's everywhere. He's, he's in everything, and he, his memory is still very strong. He's still referred to as Grandpa. He's not referred to in past tense at all. One year after Jim's passing, his family made a pilgrimage to the sites of their summer homes. They had not visited since living there with Jim more than 25 years before. Okay, so it was right here we used to play, right? Yeah, right around here. here. We're right, right around here there used to be a, our horsey. <laughs> Remember our horsey? Our horsey tree? Actually, this is the whole area who was our player area. And Grandpa would watch from up in the tower there, just watch us from there. Like, you know, that was his um, site, I guess. We had, uh, what do you call it, uh, a boundary where he let us play. And that was just where he cut the grass, which would be like all this clearing. So if we got we past that, you'd hear him yelling from up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wave at him. It's one of the little things that we looked forward to, I guess, when he was up there in the tower was, uh, it was probably, it was planned. You could tell it was planned, so that made it extra special because he would collect little treasures for like, he'd get a bag of candy or a little pencil or crayon or just any kind of little treats. And he would uh, take this matchbox and he would uh, fill it with these little goodies that he would take up with him to the tower and then that would be a game for him, for us, like to find these treats. Um, and he would call, call Tammy and I and Audrey. He'd yell down and he'd say, this is for Tammy or... Look inside them. Um, and it was just so exciting to open up that uh, matchbox and find <laughs> and compare the treasures. You know, that, was, that was nice, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Grandpa. <laughs> Garden. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember this little, oh, yeah, the little rocks? <gasps> These are the yeah, ones that, those uh, are the ones. Yeah. He used to always do that. Mm -hmm. Well, he paint, He painted these rocks, I but guess. Yeah. They're still here, hey? Yeah. Can't believe these rocks are still here. Yeah. After all these years. Yeah. At least 25 years. Yeah, they've been here. I remember, special, do you remember special, when take yeah. it over and then look at under the rocks for these little ants? Their ants yeah. are still there. <laughs> you always have a little bit of... Uh, uh, not lesson, but just a, a little, yeah, a little lesson on nature, I guess. Yeah, the little critters are still in there. <laughs> he would just take us aside there and uh, turn over the rock and show us the ants and just made sure that we didn't uh, dis disturb them too much, but, you know, because we were curious, we wanted to see what was under there, and he had painted these pretty rocks, and, and uh, but he would go right there with us and show us and teach us like you know you can't disturb these little critters <laughs> you can't disturb them you know they have their little home their tunnel and um, you can look at them and enjoy them that way but not to destroy or um, intrude yeah intrude There's a saying that, um, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words, you know, which means that, you know, you live your life as a good human being. And if you have to t talk about it, then you do. But be an example of what you want to see uh, in the world and go for it. And so that's what Jim did in his final years. He, 
he went for it in a, in a way that maybe put him on a different platform, in a different place, uh, maybe out of the wild, but still maintaining that sense of uh, a, a deep spirituality that he saw reflected in nature, that he embodied in his relationships, his Wakota win, with his people and with all people. He would do his usual trick of summing things up and it's bringing it to light or summing it up in its most simple form. And he would probably tell me, Lothar, you have to be kind to your neighbor. I don't think he would tell me anything more than that. Jim's kindness helped communities from across the province come home to their stories and to their heritage. He was a kind of living archive for us because he, uh, he, loved, he loved the, the diocese and he knew its whole history. Um, and he was someone who we could always go to uh, to find out uh, what really had happened in the past. And James would always know. Jim was consulted as an oral historian by academics, First Nation and Métis communities, pioneer organizations, historical societies, and forestry associations. His own band, the Montreal Lake Cree Nation, depended on his knowledge to fully document the timber surrender that occurred on their reserve in 1904. Timber surrender is when uh and we had a lot of trees here at one time. And the, the government come in and clear cut the whole reserve. Just clear cut everything. And without proper permission from our, uh, from our headman and uh, from our chief at that time, Jim was one of those people that knew a lot where, where the sawmills were set up in that and uh, a lot of the lumber that was taken. Eh? He, he knew a lot of that information. Looking at the land base to what it looks like today and what it looked like before the timber har was harvested, I mean, there's, it's a night and day difference. And um, what he likely would have uh, preferred is to have a replanting of this uh, reserve with trees. Uh, the timber companies, uh, when they did their, their counts, um, I think missed a few um, a few trees in the in those numbers. <laughs> anyway, I mean, that's, that's the gist of it all. <laughs> Jim's community work embraced three worlds: First Nation, Métis, and non-Aboriginal. But it was not always easy. Part of the challenge came from governmental laws that divided the Aboriginal community by giving some family members treaty status and others Métis status and treating the two groups very differently. Like myself, I'll explain it this way. My mom was a treaty, married to my dad, and she, she lost her treaty rights for a long time until my... my my uh, dad died a few years after. She got it back. She got back her treaty rights. That's how I got my treaty rights. All of the family, eh? So it's Jim Sati. In this world of shifting labels, Jim experienced prejudice. From both the white and First Nation communities, although he never spoke of it, Friends could see that he made a conscious choice to walk the road of love and respect, even in very trying circumstances. He made it a point, I think, not to affect him. When I think back at what he, what he was about, you know, and, and that he said, who are we to reject anybody, I think was probably a quote that I can share with you with him. You know, who are we to reject anybody? I think he could feel some people that were so hostile that he couldn't, you know, probably, I think Jim could feel it. He never said so, but I knew him pretty good. Knowing Jim, he would have sort of forgiven him, you know. He would, 
he would chalk it down to. He wouldn't say it, but he would chalk it down to a little bit of ignorance on their part. That's how I would think Jim would look at it. He certainly wouldn't insult them or anything like that. He never did around me anyway. He never said anything to anybody. He was a gentleman, Jim. Yeah, he was a... Uh, I missed him when he was gone, Jim, you know? My grandpa was very patient and kind to everybody. It didn't matter who you were or what your skin color was, or if you were female or male, he treated everybody the same. Jim's legacy continues to bring people of all traditions home. As this film is being made, local Métis are working to create a heritage center at the Fish Lake site. His information on traditional settlement in the park area has helped give those families maps of their home communities. And as part of the original Prince Albert National Park Heritage Committee, his vision has helped create a cultural site in the park, bringing all people together to celebrate the local First Nation and Métis story. This project was initiated by our elders, actually, from this area, including James. Um, they wanted to have an area set aside in the park where, um, again, the First Nation and Métis communities could come together and promote their, their language, their culture, their traditions, uh, their values of, of living on the land. And they wanted to share that with, with the public. Jim is still bringing people home today, through many who barely knew him. One park naturalist, inspired by Jim's story, created a program for children to learn how to track in the forest and to find their way in life. What does home mean to you, Travis? Really safe and warm. A place of belonging. A safe place that you want to be. So imagine that you might be Jim City someday and you might be able to actually find somebody who's a lost maybe in the bush or maybe somebody who's lost in spirit, who just doesn't know where they want to go in life and maybe you could be a friend to that person. You could be like a modern day Jim City. Jim's life points homeward through the past, present, and future, all at the same time. He inspires me to look at my own past, and I decide to make a trip to Manitoba to see the home place of my great-grandparents. In the 1870s, they lived at Poplar Point and St. Andrews, communities of the Red River Settlement Area, birthplace of the Métis Nation in Canada. While there, I find some things about Jim's family including the journals of his great-grandfather, the Reverend James Satie Sr. Suddenly, one entry jumps out at me. June 25th, 1875. I came to Poplar Point for the evening service. Poplar Point is another village that is in my charge. The people there are half-breeds. They were once parishioners of St. Andrews. I realize that my own great-grandparents may have known the Reverend James Satie and seen him as a spiritual guide. Time stands still, and in that moment, our ancestors, mine and Jim's, seem very close to me. I feel like I am coming closer to home, to my sense of where I belong. At one time when we were visiting, I asked him, Jim, you know, what's the most important thing we can remember as people? And he said to me, the most important thing is just to love each other unconditionally. That gave a name for me to how he lived his life, what he gave to everyone that he met whether they were a friend, a family, or a stranger. Or whether they were a lost boy in the bush. I'm starting to understand that Jim's love and empathy helps him find that boy and bring him home. 
Jim told me that when he looked for any lost person, he put himself into the mind of the person who was lost. He said that when he found that particular boy, the boy was paralyzed with fear and he couldn't talk. Jim just sat down next to him silently for half an hour until the boy found his way back inside himself and then they walked out of the bush together. I got to stop and think, think for the second try to, to read his uh, thinking. I wanted to go out And in his quiet way, he said, Lothar, that's how he pronounced my name, Lothar, if you know what the wild animals do, it's not difficult to separate a child's track from them. And uh, there was that period of silence, and he looked at me and, and gave me an opportunity to think. And then he told me, Lothar, everybody is different. Their uniqueness will allow you to find them. We all felt unique and special with Jim. His caring still brings us home to something true in ourselves. His kindness connects us to the larger home we share with all people and the ancestors, with the lake, the forest, and with the ants under the rocks. The heart of the Lost Boy story has become a life teaching for me. It has become the inner home I return to. And now, when I think of Jim, I can sit gently with the world around me and quietly with myself, and then I can find my way. Jim's gentle kinship with the world is celebrated by singer Connie Calder, who met Jim for only one afternoon. She was so moved by this visit that she wrote this song for Jim. It's called Old Friends, Mr. Settee's song. I first saw this lake back in 17, all freight in the winter overland. And I remember the first white man We are old friends, this lake and I And just like old friends, we sit and talk together And I hope I'm underneath them when I die. We are old friends, this lake and I. Yeah, we are old Jim and my ancestors are still feeling very close to me. I'm coming home to some kind of peace about who I really am, where I belong, where we all belong in this extended family. Someone once said to me that our lives are like waves on a lake, and when we die, we return like a wave to our home and to the ancestors. That would mean that we are very old friends. The ancestors, the lake, and you, and I. We are old friends, this lake and I. Yeah, we are old friends, this lake and I.
I'll never forget the last thing Jim said to me. Whenever I feel lost, I remember this and it reminds me of all I learned from him. I had been in the hospital that week visiting Jim and visiting with his family and one night I went in to see him on my own. And he was in bed, in the hospital bed and he sat up and he said to me with great happiness, I'm going home tomorrow. And I thought in the back of my mind, I wasn't sure which home he meant. I didn't think it was PA or Little Red because he was too ill to leave the hospital. But I said to him, ah, oh, that's great, Jim. And he said, will you give a message to my daughter? I said, of course I will. What do you want me to say? And he said, tell her there are a lot of roads, but I know which one to take. Tell her I know the way home. And I said, of course, I'll tell her. And he was so happy. And he took his hands out from under his blankets. And he took my hands and he pulled me down to him and he kissed me and he said, okay, thank you. Goodbye now. Thank you.